Anybody here? Who's he been the best to? What an incredible father that we have. He's not detached. He's not difficult to find. He's not hard to reach. He's always available. And there's just none like him tonight. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of John, the fourth chapter. And I'll begin reading in verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied with the journey, sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were going away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. For a few moments tonight, I want to speak to you from the subject, the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. The Lord bless you may be seated. Before I begin tonight, again, let me say what incredible honor it is to be here. When I started preaching at 17 years of age, a long time ago, I promised the Lord that if I ever got an invitation, I'd never turn it down. Now, I have kept my promise. But I didn't promise God I'd ever go back. <laughs> and I'll have to say that I've been to some places that I didn't ever intend to go back to. <laughs> This is not one of those places. You folks are very easy to preach to because, first of all, you pay attention and you listen. And I am old school. I'm not going to put anything on that screen other than the Word of God. Well, I have a whole bunch of stuff I could put up there, but I'm not going to do it because we've, been, we've become too lazy to pay attention. According to what the world says through their research, this generation can't focus unless there's flashing lights or a lot of bling. And I refuse to put a lot of bling or flashing lights up. The Word of God is the answer to life. It is the most important thing in our life. And when we fall in love with it, it's what changes our lives. It's what makes us different. So we believe the Word of God is inspired and infallible. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, day, forever. Now, through history, man has tried to destroy it and prove it wrong, but he's never been successful doing that. What we have and enjoy is the greatest gift you could ever be given. And I want to share with you tonight the Word of God so that you can truly understand what you have been empowered with. It's been good to be here with Brother and Sister Blankenship, uh, it's just an honor to be with them. Such incredible people. I love to hear him laugh because he reminds me of Brother Billy Cole. There's just a little bit about his laugh that sounds like him. 
And when I hear it, I, I, I remember some incredible people that's impacted my life. And it's just a joy and honor to be here tonight. And I pray that something I say will help you to have a, a better relationship with Jesus. See, I am convinced that God's kids live beneath their privilege. See, I'm convinced we often bring sack lunches to, to, to a banquet. It's his desire that we are filled, that we enjoy our relationship. The relationship that we get to enjoy is not earned. You don't deserve it. And you don't get it in pieces. You don't get the Holy Ghost in doses. You don't get your tank filled up a little bit and you got to fill it more, fill it more, fill it more, fill it more. That's not what the Holy Ghost is. Jesus said the Holy Ghost is a new birth. You're going to be born of water and of spirit. And that new birth makes you a child of God. We're born into His family. Now, there are a lot of children around here, and I could ask all the mothers, when they were born, did they come in pieces? Did you get an arm one day and a leg the next and a body the next and another leg, another arm, a head, and you snapped it all together and got a kid? Well, how can you get more of the Holy Ghost when you get it all to start with? Paul said to the Colossians, you are complete in him. You don't need something else. We just don't understand what we have. And we have never truly used it to its greatest ability. And, it, and, and use it in the way that God has designed it to work in our lives. I've been intrigued with the book of John for a long time probably 10 years now. And it was about 10 years ago that I was preparing the week after Christmas to travel the next week to go minister at a conference. And, and I, I was reading this passage of Scripture that I read to you tonight. And I, I noticed the first verse that I read to you, and it just caught my attention. He must needs go through Samaria. Jesus never told any of his disciples where he was going. He didn't tell them we're headed to Samaria. He just got them up early one morning and said we're headed back towards Nazareth. And he took a long way home. The, the easiest path from where he was beside Jordan, he had been teaching with John's disciples and had converted some of John's disciples. They were now following him. And the easiest way to where he needed to go was just to follow the Jordan River. There's a valley. It's very easy to get from where he was at to where he was going. To get to where he actually went to, he had to climb out of that valley, which had cliffs on either side that were 12 to 16, 1,800 feet high. So to get out of the valley, you basically had to climb a mountain especially on that, the east or western side of Jordan. On the eastern side, there's a valley wall, but it's miles away from the Jordan to that first row or that first cliff. It's not a very long distance, maybe five miles at the most. So to get from where he was to where he was going required a lot of effort. Now, God has never been confined to time. God don't live in time right now. God has never lived in time, and God won't live in time. Now, that's hard for our human brains to even comprehend. But He was before time, and He is after time. If He is omnipresent, if He's everywhere, according to physics, then time don't exist because time is defined by how long it takes to get from point A to point B. If you're at point A, point B at the same time, time doesn't exist. So 
God has never lived in time. Now, the Gospel of John is a very unique letter. It is not a history of the life of Jesus. By the time John writes his Gospel, the church is at least 70 years old. The world knows who Jesus is. By the time he takes pen at the end of his life, somewhere around 100 to 107 A.D., and starts writing this last book of the Bible, the church is established. There are millions of converts, and that's not an exaggeration, millions that have been affected by the gospel. So John's writing is not to give us a history of the life of Jesus, but it's to give us revelations that if we didn't have, we wouldn't understand the true relationship we have with God. See, without John's writing, I couldn't explain the new birth because I wouldn't have the Nicodemus story. I wouldn't be able to tell you unless a man is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven without John writing that. So here's this old man at the end of his life realizing that the church needs some information they don't have. So he sits down and begins to write details about the ministry of Jesus that are incredibly important. Every story in the Gospel of John has a revelation in it. Every story. There's not a story there that doesn't have some incredible significance. John begins by explaining to us who Jesus really is. Matthew traces the lineage of Jesus back to Abraham. Luke traces the lineage of Jesus back to Adam, the Son of God. But John says it like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. He traces the lineage of Jesus to God. This is not man. It's not about Adam. It's not about Abraham. This is about God creating a body to live in by the name of Jesus Christ. And God dwelt in that body. He tabernacled in that body. And in the second chapter of John, he lets us know that Jesus knew all men's heart. There was never a moment in the life of Jesus he was caught off guard. Not one time did something happen that he didn't have a clue was going to happen. Because God is timeless. He's already in your tomorrow before you get there. He's already lived. He's already gone into your future before you ever get to your. He's been there. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. And the beauty of God is even knowing that tomorrow you're going to do something bad, He blesses you today. When you ask forgiveness, He doesn't say, three weeks in the future you'll do this again. He just says, here's my blood, apply it to your life. Take the sponge, dip it in the vinegar and water, erase Blot out the sin that you've committed. Erase it so it doesn't exist anymore. See, he's timeless. He understands man. He knows man's heart. Jesus knew what time that woman would get to that well. And he got up early enough in the morning to get to that well in time to get rid of 12 men. He got there early enough to send all. When did it ever take 12 men to buy lunch? They didn't have any meat. So he sent all 12 of them to town because he knew a lady was coming, and if she showed up and they were present, she would never respond to him the way he needed her to. So he got rid of the problem because when they showed up, they were thinking, why is he talking to a woman? 
Well, the reason he was talking to a woman is because that woman represented his bride. And that woman represented what he was going to do to protect her and make sure her life was whole. When the first Adam didn't protect his wife, when the second Adam showed up, he went to a well to make sure her life wouldn't be wrecked anymore by the men that were around her. So he shows up at this well to give her a revelation that freed her to get rid of her past so she wouldn't be controlled by her past anymore because she left her water pot at his feet and went back to town and converted the whole town as a result of the encounter she had with Jesus Christ. See, that woman represents all of humanity. It represents, she represents every one of us. Now, I've heard people talk about her in terms that would make her to be immoral. But you can't prove that by the Word of God. Oh, she had five husbands, but she had no right of divorce. Now, a man, on the other hand, could divorce her for any reason. Remember Matthew 19, Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, can a man put away his wife for every cause? She burnt the toast. She don't smile anymore. She don't make me happy. I just don't like her. Whatever the reason, he could get rid of her. She had no control of her life. Her father did. She had been rejected by five different men and sent home. Dad had to find a man he would give a dowry to. He had to pay a man to take her. And every man had to do that. That's the way men saw women in Jesus' day. They were just an object you own that you could get rid of any time. So the first thing Jesus does in his ministry is show up at a wedding to force those same 12 men to figure out how you treat a bride. And he took them to a wedding so that he could show them you don't ever let the bride be embarrassed, shamed, or humiliated. You make sure that she can't be mocked or made fun of or ridiculed. You make sure that her life is protected at all times. So now he's at this well with this woman, and he starts a conversation with her. He said, would you please give me a drink? And her immediate response was, why are you asking me to drink? I am, first of all, a woman, and you're a rabbi. How did she know he was a rabbi? She knew by his clothes. He had a robe on that represented the fact that he's a rabbi. So she could identify him by the way he was dressed. She knew he was a rabbi, and she also knew that he was a Jew. And so she says, why are you asking me to drink? You're not even supposed to be talking to me. Why would you even respond to me? Jesus speaks to her, and he uses a term that put her at peace. He said to her, woman, if you simply knew who it is that says to you he would give you to drink, you would ask of him and he'd give you living water and you would never thirst again. Now when he called her woman, in our world that's a derogatory term. In Jesus' world, that was a term of endearment. Our closest word to that Greek word he used is not woman or female or lady or mother. The closest word we have in our language to that word is queen. He called her. He, he set her apart and elevated her to a position of honor and respect. And when he elevated her to that position of respect, then she let her walls down. 
And she instantly said, I would like some of that water. Now, where is Jesus at? He's at Jacob's well. You ought to study the history of this well and where we're at. This well is located between two mountains, Gerizim and Ebal. This is the valley Israel came to when they crossed Jordan and divided the nation into six tribes on one mountain, six tribes on the other mountain, and they that one side said what the law was and the blessings of obeying the law, and the other side had to quote the curses that would happen to them if they didn't follow the plan of God and the will of God. It was also the area where there were the, the Ten Commandments was plastered into the side of that mountain. But the well is the well Jacob dug when he got back from Laban's house. He had a birthright and a blessing, but he had nothing to show for it. So when he arrives back to the promised land, he bought a piece of property off the Canaanites and he dug a well. The problem with this well is it never found the water table. It's just a hole in the ground about 150 feet deep. It doesn't have continuous water flowing through it. It only collects water that comes off of the mountains in the spring and fall when the rains come, and it just is a cistern that collects the water. As a result, it's not safe to drink. There's little bugs in it. There's little amoebas and protozoas, and if you drank it, you'd have real problems in your life. To drink this water, you'd have to boil it. But Jesus was willing to step to that lady's level just to show her what he was here for and what he was about. And when she recognized that he's not going to harm her, she starts inquiring, give me some of that water, I want to drink it. And when she starts inquiring that she would like to drink, what does Jesus say to her? You need to go get your husband because he needs to be part of this. And she says, I don't have one. And he says, correct. You don't have a husband. The one you're with now, he's not your husband. But you've had five husbands before. Now, that could have offended a lot of people. But it didn't offend her because she realized he knew something about her he, he shouldn't know which made him to be something greater than what she was seeing. And so she instantly recognizes that he might be a prophet. And so she starts inquiring, and, and she says to him, where do we worship? There's a tabernacle. There's actually a temple right at the top of that mountain called Gerizim which existed at that time, that was a replica of the one in Jerusalem. We worship there. You say, Jerusalem, where do we worship? And Jesus declared to her, The day cometh, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeketh such. It's not that mountain. It's not Jerusalem. The day's coming where men are going to worship me, and when they worship me, I will be finding them. They don't have to find me. You don't have to find God. You don't have to clap your hands to wake Him up. All you've got to do is call His name, and He's instantly where you're at because He hears your voice, and the instant any human calls His name, He said, I will immediately find Him because I'm going to seek those that want to worship me. She said, we know that Messiah comes. Are you him? And his response was simply, ego ami leiloi son, which literally translates, I am that I am is speaking to thee. She asked to see the Messiah, and he gave her the revelation that he was God in flesh. She is the first human that he revealed his deity to. And when he revealed his deity to her, 
she instantly recognized and accepted the fact that he is God in flesh and left the water pot and went back to town and converted the whole town and brought the whole town out that wouldn't even let her come and draw water inside of town, that she brought them back and they all heard him and they all said, the scripture says they were all converted. All begged him to stay, and he spent two days there. But he says to this lady, if you just knew what I had to offer, I have a gift for you. If thou knewest the gift of God, the Greek word that's used here is doria. There are nine different words in the Greek language for gift. Chara, charis. Doron, Doria, several others. They all have a different meaning. A Doron is a gift that you have to pay for. Now, in just a few weeks, probably everybody here will get to open a package. And the package you're going to open, somebody else is going to give to you. And if someone gives you a gift, they either have to spend their time and make it or go to work and make money and buy it. So it's going to cost. Everybody that gives it to you, it's going to cost something. Now the problem with gifts that cost, if it didn't cost you, but it cost somebody else, it's not valuable to you. And they'll probably wind up being taken back the next day or in a garage sale shortly thereafter because it's never what we really wanted. But the term Jesus used to this lady is not Doron, it's Doria. He said, I want to give you a gift. And the gift I give you is not a gift that costs. There's no sacrifice involved. The gift I'm going to give you is because I have the power and the authority and the ability to give it. It's part of me, and I want to share it with you because I want you to have this gift. Now, some of us can get those kind of gifts in our life that we don't want to give away, and you keep passing. They're called heirlooms. And you pass them from generations. I have one at my house. It's over 150 years old. My great-grandfather created it with his hands. It's a violin that's got a liberty head coin on the back of it and a fox head on the end of it where the strings tighten. And all of it's handmade 150 years ago. My uncle owned it and called me several years ago. He had no children and wanted to know if I'd like it. I said, sure, I'd love to have it. He said, well, if you'll come get it, it's yours. I said, I'll be there Saturday. And I drove five hours and picked it up and took it home. Now, the, my family's fighting over who's going to get it. But this, this gift Jesus wants to give you, you don't have to give away. It is a gift that's designed for you particularly. And if you ever learn how to use it, you won't ever want to let it go because it has incredible power and ability. The Holy Ghost is God's gift to man. Now, the term doria is often called epexgetical. That means you can switch it with another word and they mean the same, and you don't change the definition by doing so. And the word you can switch it with is Holy Ghost. When you say Holy Ghost, it means gift. When you say gift, it means Holy Ghost. So every place you see the term Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost in the New Testament, swap it out with the gift, and it's still the same word that's being said. And it's this gift that He wants to give us that has such incredible power and ability. It's, it's the gift. It's the Spirit that overshadowed Mary and produced Jesus. 
It's the same spirit that gave Jesus the ability to walk on water, to open blind eyes, to raise the dead, to heal the lame, the sick, the diseased. It's the same spirit living in him that he said, I'm going to give to you, which gives you the power and the authority to use it just like he did. The Holy Ghost is God saying, okay, this is me living in you, and when I live in you, I will give you the ability to do what I did. What did Jesus say in John 14? Greater works than these shall ye do. Whatever I've done with the gift you're going to receive, you can repeat it and you can do more than I did if you simply choose to use it. Now, you don't have to use it if you don't want. But if you choose to use it, it can become the greatest resource in your life. It, it can cause all kinds of things to happen if you simply learn how to use this gift. Several years ago, I was at camp meeting, and a pastor tapped me on the shoulder. 30-something years ago, back in the early 90s. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, well, let's go over here. So we walked around the camp meeting I was at. The building's 300 foot wide and 250 foot long, and it's a huge place, seats 10,000 people. Massive platform. So we walked around the edge of it, and he said, I, I, I have a family in my church I need you to talk to. Would you do it? I said, Sure. Have him call me. So the next week I got a phone call and set up an appointment. Husband and wife shows up. And when they walk into the room, I am quite shocked by the difference in the two. He's about 6'2. He's got a 23 or 24 inch neck probably weighs 300 plus pounds, and, and he's not overweight. I, he's just huge. He, he's just massive man standing here. When I shook him, his hands were almost twice as big as mine. This just big guy standing here in front of me. And beside him is this little lady, less than five foot tall, and if she weighed 90 pounds, it had been someone had to put their shoe on it to get her there. I mean, just this little tiny lady standing beside this guy. They sit down. He sits in the first chair. She sits in the second one. And I watched as her chair started moving. And in a little while, it disappeared. The desk I was sitting at, had a credenza down one side of it, and she pushed her chair against the wall and disappeared. I can't even see her. I can hear her, but I can't see her. So we talked. We didn't get anywhere. Conversation was over. The husband said, can we come back? I said, sure. He said, next time, would you talk to her first? And then, or talk to me separate and her separate? I said, sure. So next week, he came. They came. He's the first one in. He said, she asked me to go first, so I'm here. Now, I need to tell you some things about my wife that she can't tell you right now, simply because she don't know you, and she probably won't trust you. But I, I'm going to share with you what she's told me. And she has been horribly abused. Her parents are backslidden Pentecostals. And dad's a drunk. And when dad gets drunk, he becomes incredibly mean. He starts telling me stories. It's hard for me to really 
believe those kind of stories. They, they're secondhand. It's not from her. She wouldn't tell me any. Our conversations were very shallow. It took almost six months before she trusted me enough to talk to me. And she comes in, first time she opens up to have a conversation with me, she brings a photo album. And she laid it on the desk, and she opened it. And I, I look at it, and there's this lady sitting on a vinyl couch back in the 50s. And beside her is this little child wrapped in a blanket. She's not holding the child. It's laying beside her. She's got her hands on her knees, and she's staring straight ahead. She's not looking at the camera. And she said, that's me. That's my mother. It's time stamped. Month, year is on the photograph. Every photo in that album has a date on it. And every photo is a picture of what he did to her or her mother whenever this took place. When I looked at the photo carefully, I could tell her jaw was broke. It's hanging over the side. He come in drunk. She's nursing a child. He starts screaming, you love her more than you love me. Snatched the child out of her arms. Cocked a pistol and shoved it in the mouth of the child. Said, I'm going to kill her. The side of that pistol ripped the top of her mouth open. I'm going to kill her. Mom starts begging, don't, please don't. He beat her to a bloody pulp, then forced her to dress before he took her to the emergency room and had her jaw wired back together, took photos of it. She was six weeks. And that was the beginning of abuse. That album had all kinds of pictures in it. Every time something happened, there's a photograph. As a result, of the incredible physical abuse she experienced. She's got back issues, kidney issues, as a result of beatings. She had all kinds of other problems as a result. Sexual abuse started shortly thereafter. One sister had a child by dad that's so deformed, it's in a mental institution, and so is the sister that had the child. She lost her mind as a result of this evil father. Now, here she is. Now, her pastor had told me, this, is, this lady is my greatest prayer warrior. If she says God's told her something, you write it down in stone because it will be absolutely correct. We talked for several months in February of that next year, sitting there one night at a table, a six-year-old voice starts talking to me. It scared me. I'd read about it, studied it, but I couldn't believe that kind of stuff actually happened. Now I'm looking at it. And when it happened, I realized the problem. She starts sobbing hysterically. Mucus running out of her nose. She looks like a little kid. It's running on the table. And she, this child is saying, please don't tear my house down. Please, this is the only safe place I have. And I said, I know what your problem is. She said, what? I told her. She said, yes, but people think I'm possessed. So she left. The next week she came back. She said, I was praying. And the Lord said, the answer to my problem is found in Romans chapter 8. If you'll go read Romans chapter 8, you'll find out how to help me. So I went home, read Romans 8. I reread Romans 8. I read Romans 8. I reread Romans 8. I read, Ro I read it about 10 times. I couldn't find an answer nowhere. So I thought, okay, maybe it's lost in translation. Her pastor said, if God said it, Chisel it in stone. It's a fact. So I went and got my Greek text, 
sat down at my dining room table, and I started translating. My wife come in and said, what are you doing? I told her, I'm, I'm going to translate Romans 8. She said, okay, I'll keep the kids away. They were eight, nine at the time. She, she took them, and so I sat there at my dining room table, and I start translating Romans chapter 8. As I'm translating, I realize that all the pronouns are in third person. But you don't do any injustice to the Scripture to make it first person. Actually, every letter written in the New Testament, you can personalize and make it to yourself. And you have not done any kind of injustice to the letter that was written. Ephesians didn't even have a name in it. It was blank. And it was to be sent to each church. And they were to put the name of the church in the blank space because it applied to everybody. So there's not, you're, you're not doing any injustice to translate it. In verse 26 of Romans chapter 8 has the answer. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth. The pronoun's our. Well, let's change it. First person. My infirmities. When I know not what I should pray as I ought. The, holy, the gift maketh intercessions for me with groaning and utterances. And the Spirit knows the mind of God. That word helpeth is a word picture. It's like a wall is built across this room. You can't get around it. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. You can't get through it. And something has been driven through that wall so far you can't get a hold of it. So it literally translates to take hold of along with or to take hold of on the other side. The Holy Ghost, the gift was given. The Spirit, likewise the gift also helpeth my infirmities. That word means any kind of problem you could have. Disease, financial disaster. Whatever your need is, that word covers any kind of problem you could have in your life. Likewise, the gift also helpeth my issues, my problems, my sickness, my disease. When I don't know what I should pray as I ought, the gift itself maketh intercessions for me with groanings. So I went back. The next week she showed up. I said, I found the answer, I think. And I explained to her what I just explained to you. And she said, oh, my, I've been doing that for a long time. Just didn't know what I was doing. I'll take care of this problem tomorrow. Thank you. Turned around and walked out. That was it. <laughs> showed up the next week with a smile on her face. I said, what happened? She said, I did it. I hired a babysitter. I went to the church the next day. I spent six hours in intercession praying in the Holy Ghost, and when I got through, I had my life back. I had no blank spots in my brain. I had no blank spots in my memory. There are no divisions or walls that, uh, of separation as, that as a result of the, of the chaos I experienced. I had it all back in just a few moments' time of praying. See, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a gift. And if you'll just learn how to use it, it doesn't matter what happens to you in life. This gift is your answer to overcome whatever life may produce. If life causes you issues and problems and hurts and, and heartaches and, and all kinds of other things, it doesn't matter what life's done. If you'll just say, okay, Jesus, I don't know how to do this and what I need to pray, but you do. The Spirit knows what needs to take place. The gift knows what needs to happen. So, Jesus, here's what I'm, I'm going to yield to you, and you pray what I need to pray. The intercessory prayer, praying in the Holy Ghost, is God's gift to you to help you solve any problem you have. Andrew Newberg, in studying the human brain, apparently discovered that there are people who speak in tongues. So he advertised in the newspaper, I believe it was in Pittsburgh, and he advertised in the newspaper for anybody that would come 
and participate in his studies. He wanted to see what a human brain looked like speaking in tongues. And he got 19 people show up. Now, us Pentecostals would think that's being sacrilegious. Um, didn't Peter say something like, this wasn't done in a corner? You think God's got a problem with the world figuring out what this is about? So the first lady that showed up, he interviewed her and asked her, how, how do you speak in tongues? Well, whenever God moves, I speak in tongues. Uh, can you do it at any time? No. You, you mean you just can't do it? No. But if God moves on me, I can speak in tongues. Well, what do you need? Where are you at? How does this happen? Usually it's at my house, and I have a prayer room at my house, and and I'll start singing songs and worshiping, and, and then the Holy Ghost moves, and I start speaking in tongues. Well, would you do that here? Well, I might if God wants me to. Well, we'll create the room to represent your room at your house. And so they created a prayer room in the hospital with a glass window that that's, has a mirrored glass, so she can't see them, but they can see her. And they bring her in, hook her up, Put a pick line in because they're going to inject her with a radioactive isotope and then go and take pictures through a spec scan to see what the brain was doing at the time of injection. So she's there, starts worshiping, and guess what happened? She started speaking in tongues. So the doctor realized that they'd started wrong, so he stopped. He said, we, we got to get a baseline. We don't know what the brain looks like before she does it. So we got to take her back now and do the spec scan and, th and then come back. So they, they took her back. I mean, this is the first one. They don't know what to do or how to do it. So they take her back, do the first spec scan, do a, a baseline of what her brain looks like, and take her back and say, do you think you can do that again? She said, I don't know. If God wants it to happen, it'll happen. Okay? So five, ten minutes later, she's praying and worshiping, and she got... She, she just put them out of her mind, and it wasn't long before she started speaking in tongues a second time. And he turned to his assistant and said, I, I wonder when we need to put the injection in. Do we need to wait, or do we need to do it now? Or, and, and so they waited several minutes before they injected her. And then they took her, examined her brain. They were quite shocked at their discovery. According to Andrew Newberg, you can go online, look him up, you can listen to him lecture, he'll tell the story I'm telling. According to his discovery, guess what he's discovering? When you speak in tongues, the part of your brain that controls your tongue and vocal cords is not working. Well, isn't that how it should be? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire it set upon each of them. And they all began to speak with tongues as the Holy Ghost, the, the gift, gave the utterance. What he did discover is the part of your brain that's lit up like a Christmas tree is your sensory perception. It's like every nerve on your skin is touched and stroked all at the same time. So when you start speaking in his language, God just wraps himself around you. And your brain understands the touch, the feeling that happens as a result of what takes place in your life when you start speaking in His language. I want to give you a gift that man can't explain. Now, Newberg won't say God's doing it. He just says that Pentecostals say they're being moved on. We don't know what's happening, but we, they say they're being moved on by God. Well, the Bible says that's what's happening. I'm going to give you a gift. And that gift will give you the ability to heal your life, transform your life, 
if you'll just not be afraid to use it. A little over a year ago, I was flying back home, landed. I had to switch planes, landed at an airport, I think Chicago. Had a few minutes to open my laptop, check my emails, and a, a news article popped up. It caught my attention. So I downloaded it, closed my laptop, got on the plane, and from Chicago to Houston, almost three hours of flight, I opened my laptop up and I started reading this news article. And the article was entitled that scientists have discovered that human DNA can be altered by sound and vibration. So as I read the article, there's all kinds of footnotes. You can go study and go, go find the research where they got the information from. It's all out there. You can find it if you want to look for it. But the article said that our DNA is altered by sound and vibration. What's speaking in tongues? So he said, I'm going to give you a gift if you just use it. that will give you the ability to alter things that you don't have control over. They've discovered that DNA actually can communicate. It's like a computer. It's a storage device. It, it stores data, but it also communicates. They took a queen ant out of an ant colony and took her to another location. As long as she's alive, the ant colony still thrives. The instant something happens to her, the ant colony disappears. She's not even in the same location. The only way that's happening is DNA. And they discovered that the sound that alters DNA is 528 megahertz. Well, 528 megahertz is not middle C, but it's the second C on the piano. According to some music professors, middle C, or C, is the key that all of nature sings in. Well, wouldn't that kind of be like God to do that? They discovered that you could take DNA, suspend it in a fluid, bring humans in, and say harsh things or hard things or curse at each other, scream at each other, examine that DNA, and discover that it had become damaged as a result of words. You could put it back in the DNA, uh, in the fluid, and bring people in and say words of kindness and affirmation, and that DNA now heals itself as a result of sound and vibration. We will never know what happened to your children by you just showing up here and being in church while they're still in your womb. See, all kinds of things could have happened, but being in the house of God, God knows the sounds necessary and the vibrations necessary to bring healing to people's lives. And that sound and vibration has the ability to heal. Proverbs said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. James said the tongue is an unruly member. It's a flamethrower. It can kill. It can destroy. We have the power through our voice to accomplish things that we never understood we could accomplish. A few months later, I was at church. had to have back surgery. had a disc that bulged and they had to shave it. So I'm at, I wasn't able to travel that weekend. I'm, I'm at home. And that Sunday morning, my brother stood up and said, we have a lady here. She's sitting in the back of the church, called her name. 
The doctors give her a very short period of time to live. She has stage four cancer. She's had it before, went into remission, but now it's back. She now has three tumors that are visible beneath the skin in her body. And she's gray in color. We don't think she'll survive. She said her husband called last night and said, the Bible says if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. We've been, y'all been calling us to pray for her. We haven't been doing it God's way. She wants to be prayed for today. Okay? He simply did this number, and I walked up, and he handed me that bottle of oil. I said, all right, Jesus, if this is really real, I want to see it happen. If the Holy Ghost is, if, if what they're saying, and this is the way you created it, then I yield you my voice and my vocal cords. And you know the sound and vibration that kill every cancer cell in that lady's body. So I yield you my voice and my vocal cords. I couldn't even get my hand on her to pray for her and the Holy Ghost. Just boom, it just came out. And when I was through, I stopped. I felt it lift. I backed off, walked away. She's about 5'8". She weighed less than 80 pounds. She was gray in color. Nothing happened. They took her home. By the next Saturday, the first tumor was gone. By the second Saturday, the third tumor was gone. And by the fourth Saturday... All tumors that were visible in her body were totally gone. Now, they wanted to make sure, so they took her back to the doctor. When she walked in and sat down, everybody there was shocked because her color's back and her weight's back. And the doctor walks in. And his first response is, who's been treating you? Nobody. No, somebody's been treating you. Who's been treating you? I want to know what kind of treatment they gave you because you're not the same person who walked in here before. Nobody has treated her. Yes, somebody. How did she change? And the husband said, we're Pentecostals. We believe in the power of prayer. And the Bible says, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. They shall lay hands on the sick, anoint them with oil, and they shall be saved. And what you see is a result of prayer. No cancer cells. No cancer. No signs of cancer. That's been two years ago. She's got her color back and her weight back. She's a different lady. Why? Because he said, I'm going to give you a gift. And if you were willing to use the gift that I'm going to give you, there is nothing you can accomplish if you'll just be willing to use the gift. God knows. He created us. He knows how our bodies work. So all we have to do is yield. It's okay, Jesus. I'm going to put the gift in, in practice here. See, if, if you've got children that are backslid, you have the power because you share their DNA to start praying for them in the Holy Ghost. And you're going to start affecting their DNA without them even knowing it because you have the ability to communicate through their life. So this gift he gave you is going to give you the power to accomplish things that you haven't even thought about. You had the power to accomplish if you just learn how to use the gift that he gave you. You don't get it in doses. He gave you everything complete the day you received the Holy Ghost. And as a result of the Holy Ghost in your life, there is nothing you can't do if you'll just allow the Holy Ghost to flow through you and operate in you and lives can be changed. Parents, what would happen to your children if you'd start on a regular basis praying in the Holy Ghost for their lives, 
What would happen if you'd lay hands on them? You don't know what to pray. You don't know how to pray against whatever's troubling them. You don't even need to know. He said, I'm going to give you a gift that's going to give you the ability to change some things in life if you want to. But you just have to choose to operate in the gift. He's not going to force you. He's not going to make you. But if you desire, you can use it anytime you choose. If you just knew the gift that I have to offer, you'd ask of me, and I would give you living water, and you'd never thirst again. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can have it. And it's the greatest thing you can have. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to harm you. But it'll make your life better. And it'll give you the ability to accomplish things that has never happened in your life. It, it gave that lady the ability to heal from life that her dad and all the junk she had went through and all the horror she had experienced she was able to get rid of it all in just a few moments' time with the gift. So whatever the need is, if you just let the gift operate, it changed your life and everybody else's life. Please stand. Gracious Father, thank you for your incredible word. Thank you for the treasures that are hidden in your word, that if we just take time to delve into your word, we'd discover some incredible truths that are there for us to enjoy and to be able to participate in. Lord Jesus, you see every heart that's here tonight. You see the diseased bodies that are here that need to be healed. You see hearts that have been broken by humans. You see lives that have been damaged by other humans. You're here today, but you gave us this gift if we just let it operate in our own lives. It'd start by first healing our lives and then give us the ability to allow our lives to start touching and healing other lives. Lord, I pray tonight that fathers and mothers wouldn't be afraid to learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost and pray until the Holy Ghost starts speaking through them. They would pray for their children, for the lives of their children, for their children to be protected and not be hurt or harmed by the world that they live in. They can't be with them 24 hours a day to protect them, but the Holy Ghost gives them a tool that they can use to offset anything the world has to offer or the world tries to use to wreck their lives or destroy them. So Jesus, I pray revelation happens in the life of your children tonight that your children understand that you gave them the greatest gift they could ever experience and have or enjoy. And that gift lives inside of them and they have the freedom and the opportunity to use it at any time, any place that they are in life and see incredible changes take place as a result of your Spirit living inside of us. Allow your sweet Spirit to, to sweep through this place tonight. Let us hear the sounds of Pentecost again as people begin to pray in the Holy Ghost as that happened that first day when your Spirit fell and they all began to speak with tongues as your Spirit began to give the utterance. In the name of Jesus. Kiara Bahasa Kaya Yaya Mahai Kiara Bakahasa Kaya Rabaha Kiandara Bahasa Kiasanara Bahaha Kahamaya Yaya Bakaha Kiara Bahana Tiakahasa Tarara Baha Kiara Bahaka Ya Kiasapandari Yara Baha Kiara Bahasa Katayara Baha Use what he gave you tonight. If your children are here and there's issues, why don't you find them and lay your hands on them and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost to see God change some things in your life and their lives. Don't whine and complain about the problems. Do something about it through prayer because he gave you the key to do it today. If you just learn how to use it and not be afraid to speak in his language, 
Do not be afraid to allow His Spirit to move. That's it. Let it out. Don't be afraid. This is what Pentecost sounded like 2,000 years ago. You're hearing it right now. They all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit began to give them the utterance. He's here. He won't make you, force you. But if you want to use it, it can't be overused. And you can't use it up. Allow His Spirit to move. That's it. We need to make our way into this altar and toward this front. And I think we just need to move into the Holy Ghost more. Hallelujah. What a word. Come on, church. Just come in, gather. Want our elders to come and be available here. If there's anybody that needs the Holy Ghost and you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost for the first time, come see one of our ministers here the rest of the body that has the Holy Ghost. I feel like we just need to get into the Spirit for a few minutes. The answer is in Him. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Oh, come on, everybody, all over this auditorium. Jesus. Break every chain. Jesus. Break every chain. You have the Holy Ghost stir up that gift within you right now. Let the Holy Ghost flow to accomplish everything He wants to do in this service.
every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Break every chain. 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 up oh well let that Holy Ghost flow in us Baptize us with a hunger. Baptize us with a hunger for this. A hunger for your spirit. Baptize us with a hunger for your spirit.
name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. Pray. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. In Jesus' name. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, yes. There is power. Break every chain, 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 to break all the chains, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. Yes, yes, yes. Praise Him, church. Let's rejoice all over this auditorium. God's pouring His Spirit out. We're baptizing people in Jesus' name. We rejoice all over this auditorium and just give God praise together right now. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for this incredible weekend, God, that you have given us. For these four sessions, God, where anointing has flowed, ministry has flowed, the word has flowed, the spirit has flowed. And everybody said amen. I want to thank Dr. Hughes for being with us this weekend. And just has unloaded an, an enormous amount of word. And if you've missed any of these sessions, we'll have them available on our social media. But the truth of the matter is, even for those of us that have been in the sessions, I, I need to hear it again. And I think we don't have a midweek service this week. I think this week it would be good to listen to that message again. The th Friday, Saturday night as well, very powerful. All of us powerful, but those two stuck out to me particularly. But there's keys that have been given. Tonight was a key. It's going to 
It's going to take us maybe a little time to fiddle with it and get it to work in the way. But I think it's opened up a door. And I think when we gather, when everybody gathers on Thanksgiving Day this week, I think it would be good for us as the people of God to understand we have an incredible amount of things to be thankful for. And the chiefest of all of that is the gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we need to thank God for it, and we need to never forget. And how about all of us? I've asked God to baptize us with a hunger. I'm asking the Lord to stir. We've been praying, asking God for an increase of miracles. And I feel like the Lord's given us one of the keys to that tonight. But we have to take it now and, and seek after it and apply it and start doing it. So let's get hungry for the, for the things of the Spirit because I feel like God's stirring it in us strong right now. Amen? Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Give God a shout of praise. In the name of Jesus, we exalt you, Lord. Thank you in the mighty name. Praise God. Thank you for being in the house of God and taking extra time this weekend for these extra sessions. Uh, and we look forward to having Brother Hughes back with us at another time and continue some of these things. Uh, God bless you. You're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. Love one another. Greet one another. There is a fellowship uh, in the fellowship hall for the ladies. Uh, God bless you in Jesus.